There we go. Hi, everyone, and welcome, Claire. It's lovely to see you today. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar and pausing for lunch. If you do want to have your lunch while we're talking, please do feel free. Um, we've got about 45 minutes where we're going to um, go through some questions there and just pick her brain. Um, but first of all, Claire, it'd be lovely just to hear a bit about you and, um, you know, what got you into this kind of line of work. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a joy at this stage of my journey to be able to sit here and, and help other people. Um, so a bit of background behind me. I was in the corporate industry for about 15 years. Um, and so I know what it's like to be in a male dominated industry and um, working to targets. And I think sometimes pretending to be someone that you're not just in order to get a job done and putting on a show throughout the day. Um, I retrained, just celebrated our 10th anniversary actually, uh, as a Pilates teacher. Um, I'm a low back pain practitioner and I, it's kind of clinical Pilates, so degree, um, not Jane's class, <laughs> not the evening classes. Um, and I work with people with neurological uh, conditions as well. So quite a broad range within that. Um, I took the decision to qualify as a menopause coach because uh, of my own journey. Um, and I'm signposting women unofficially and I really needed to put an official qualification behind it and um, practice good guidelines. So uh, here I am. Um, and my menopause journey um, is a little bit traumatic. Um, mm. It started really in my late 20s when I was having severe hot flushes and my GP uh, tested me for diabetes and then declared I was fine and I just needed to open the window and have a lighter duvet and off you go, just get mm. on with it. Um, you know, I could hold a lot against him, but at the end of the day, it's just where we were with our knowledge at that time. Um, so if we fast forward 10 years, I, I had coils in which masked all of the symptoms and I was in a really happy relationship. I thought it was totally normal that after a couple of years of being in a long term relationship that you have vaginal dryness. So I didn't think anything of that. Um, and just kind of carried on throughout life until we decided uh, to try for a family. And uh, having the coil removed was when I realized in my late 30s that I had quite a serious problem. And um, I ended up in a &E for emergency surgery with ovarian torsion. And they tested my AMH, which is how many follicles do you have left? Mm. It's only an accurate test on women under 40. So it's not used to diagnose menopause generally. Um, and I had pretty much completely shut down. Um, so we, we, we tried IVF. We went through that process. Um, and I also had another surgery to have my ovary removed um, throughout all of those you don't really consider them as traumas at the time, but with hindsight and processing them, they are traumas. Um, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's as well, thyroid disease. Um, and for those of you who don't know what the thyroid does, it controls every single cell and organ in your body. So when it's not working, you become quite severely systemically ill, um, coupled with menopause uh, symptoms. Um, one of the positives that came from this is the chap at the IVF clinic told me to go and see um, a specialist in London. And I was very lucky to get in on the NHS under this specialist. Um, but waiting four months in that position was um, a complete disaster at the time because you're just so unwell. And my GP didn't know what to do with me. Um, they are becoming much better equipped. Uh, I was speaking to a GP specialist yesterday who trains GPs, and it's really interesting to know where we are now versus where we were six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very grateful she didn't put me on antidepressants because I'm not a depressed person, um, but situationally and the symptoms that you have from menopause, 
and thyroid disease you are so unwell that that's what it's um it's illustrating um she asked me to wait another month or so just to see the specialist and then my treatment started from there um it's not plain sailing from that moment either and it's such a changeable terrain working your way through perimenopause menopause um and i think that's where it's very challenging in the workplace because perhaps and, and with any chronic condition as well perhaps people think that you get over it you tell them that you're unwell and you have a few days off work oh you're better now well it's not like that um particularly with POI premature ovarian insufficiency and I'll give you some statistics of that in a moment but um you have to work out what level of HRT works for you, what type of HRT. And just because that HRT is working for one, two, two and a half years doesn't mean it will work for you from then on after. So mm -hmm. it's having this information, knowing what lays ahead, I think is so valuable. Um, I didn't have that. And I'm involved in the medical world I have a, a really keen interest in understanding biology and the endocrine system and I'm dogged determined and motivated to get the best out of whatever I'm doing but particularly my own health it's what I do for other people so if I find that really difficult to charter through um, and I have absolutely no idea what the normal person uh, would find it so um yeah, here I am at this stage, feeling really well, thankfully, generally, most of the time, <laughs> um, and able to pull all of that information in from the specialists that I've worked with, the qualifications that I have, but more than anything, my own life experience um, within that as well, and help women through what is probably the most, can be the most challenging time of your lives, that's not just over in a flash. Um, I mean, seventy-five percent of women have uh, suffer with some kind of menopausal symptoms, ranging from subtle to uh, extreme. And one third of the of those women are suffering with extreme menopausal, perimenopausal symptoms. And that be my next question: like, how common is it? Because Thank you for sharing all of that, Claire, by the way. And, you know, I know Claire pretty well. I see her every week in her Pilates class and I didn't know that you'd been through all of that, Claire. I have to say, you know, you hide it very well. And I guess that is a thing, isn't it? We do. Yeah. Maybe that's why these stats are, are so shocking, because if I, if you said to me, like, 75% of my friends have this and a third of them are, like, seriously suffering, I don't see that. I think that's a, such a valid point. It, I, we we do hide things. I mean, I, when I set up my Pilates business, I came into it with my professional business head on from the world that you ladies are in. And you have this front on where everything is okay and you perform and you go away and you go to bed. <laughs> and if I still worked in, in, the world that I was in particularly male dominated as well I would never have survived what I've been through um because I could I was working for myself my husband my goodness me I mean just amazing and I if you if you have a partner and um, specific websites being involved is such a key component to this as well um, he took on the house so I could just go and I could make keep my Pilates business alive and I would go and teach two classes and I'd come home and go to bed and I could just about get through that and no one knew because I was still putting on a front and I think the biggest failure that happened to probably most of us is COVID because we all stopped pretending <laughs> we were all the same as each other at that stage in life and I've carried that through. I've also had a lot of work with with um, counsellors as well. And I think because of the nature of uh, premature ovarian insufficiency has such a compounding impact on your life outcome um, and what you planned. That's for me was I didn't realise how necessary it was, but it, it was very necessary. Um, so yeah, I'm much more open about my vulnerabilities and what you see is what you get. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And, you know, we should all be a bit more like that. What So in terms of sort of what you see 
in your clients or in you know the the kind of network that you have now what are the kind of effects that we should be looking out for in the workplace you know or that um you know some of us here in hr others are you know obviously have have clients and or maybe experiencing ourselves you know who are going through these kind of things so what what is it that we should be looking out for claire do you think in terms of like the symptoms or um I think changes in, in a person's, uh, if, if someone is, is seemingly um, distracted, not able to focus or, or not able to verbalize in the way that they used to be able to, um, a, a level of anxiety that's not usual for, for that personality um, or an escalated level of anxiety is, is probably one of the first things to look out for. Um, as your estrogen levels fluctuate, so perimenopause is the period of 10 years running into your final period. Um, it's not 10 years for everyone, but this is a period of time where your, your hormones are fluctuating up and down. Your progesterone is on a steady decline and it's your progesterone that helps you to sleep well. It looks after your womb. Um, your estrogen is literally all over the place. So you'll go to bed at night. You either won't be able to sleep or you'll wake up um, at three in the morning just as your cortisol level rise, that's, uh, rises. That's your stress hormone. Um, and that sleep, continued sleep deprivation has quite a compounding effect on how you're able to, to, um, to verbalize, how you're able to make decisions the following day. And if it's, if it's one night, that's okay. But studies show that over a prolonged period of time, the impact of sleep deprivation is huge. And if any, anyone's had children, then you're going to relate to that phase of your life. Um, the first two hours of your sleep are the most key for cleaning out it's the glymphatic system that's cleaning out the brain um, from the day and helping to file your your uh, your memories. And that's your dementia um, safety net as well that's occurring in those first two hours of sleep. So sleep is a really important feature that I would address with a client as soon as I can. But I think coming back to what you're going to recognize in the workplace, if that individual isn't sleeping, then their anxiety is going to be up, their verbal reasoning is going to be different, um, their decision made, making will possibly be quite erratic, not thought out and more risk risk taking, actually, um, it's quite often the way. Mm. Um, so, yeah, uh, and I could come down to the comfortability of sitting as well. I mean, for a lot of women, it's classed as vulvo vaginal health or genitourinal um, issues. But if you think about your vulva and your vagina, and these are conversations that aren't readily had in the workplace. If you your pH, pH levels have changed because estrogen levels have dropped, you've got dryness of the vagina and it's quite often of the anus as well. And that's definitely something that's not re readily talked about. Mm. So just sitting can be really painful. Um, burning, um, going to the toilet if it's the anus again. I mean, that's just really unpleasant to have to deal with at work. Mm. How do you deal with that as an employer? Well, you're not going to know about it, but having open conversations in the workplace where it's okay to say the word vagina and mm. anus and toilets and how's your chair? <laughs> checking, yeah, yeah. checking in on these. <laughs> say again, Jane. It's really hard, isn't it? It's really hard for line managers to kind of even bring up some of, I mean, I guess you you wouldn't, would you? You'd wait for the employee. You'd maybe instigate the conversation, but, you know, and hope that they were able to feel in an environment where they can be transparent. And we were going to come on to later maybe about how we can approach those kind of conversations. But, you know, you can see why for male managers, this is really a tricky area. I mean, before we go on to that, we do have a little poll, actually, that I just wanted to put up where people can say what kind of challenges they've either experienced with colleagues or with themselves in in the workplace if you're willing to to do it I'll just pop it up on the screen and it's a multi-choice so um has it come up yeah <laughs> so do um 
do fill in what are the most significant challenges either yourself or your colleagues are facing in the workplace. It's just interesting for us to know, especially following what Claire's just said, how many of those things are, you know, are common. Um, oh, where's it gone? Oh, it's still coming up. Can you see that in the, oh no, it's, I need to share it afterwards, don't I, I think. I'll just, um, anyone else want to? Just waiting for people to fill it in, there we go. Just end that and I think that will allow me to share. Can you see the? Oh, I like this, this is... Uh... Yeah, so you can see the big ones are the physical symptoms, the poor emotional well-being and the kind of brain fog, as well as that piece we just talked about there, being able to talk openly. I mean, certainly, I'm sure, Nick, your experience as well, you know, that bottom one is a really big one around for our role as, as HR is just helping to kind of normalise conversations about these things, not just menopause, but about sort of our health and mental health in particular. Um, so, yeah, uh, do you have anything to say about the, these, Claire, or are you surprised? Or um, I'm not surprised, no. Um, I'm not surprised. I mean, I when I think back to working in, in an office environment that had no air conditioning as well, I mean, I was having such severe hot flushes every hour that would debilitate me and I, I wasn't able to speak whilst I was having them. And there's lots of evidence to show what's happening to your brain during that moment as well. And the prefrontal cortex is, um, which is your decision making, rational thinking aspect sh is shutting down at that point and your emotional center is screaming out. Um, so to converse or be in a meeting in that scenario, um, it needs to be acceptable for someone to be able to get up and go and walk out, I think, mm -hmm. uh, in that scenario and it, not to be ostracized for doing so. Um, in work with your clients, sorry to interrupt you, is do you have a view on how they would like those sorts of arrangements to be made or how they would like um, this whole topic to kind of be brought up? Do you have a view on that? Um, I've thought quite a lot about how I would like it to be managed. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to share a couple of stories with you from clients. One came um, this week, a client who works in estate agents, and they're not allowed to use customer toilets, um, and therefore that think about bladder urgency, um, incontinence. It's also common with perimenopause, uh, postmenopause, as the muscle fibers change, um, and then the fear of not being able to use a toilet gets the nervous system even more overactive and we're much more likely to have urgency to pee. And you can't use a toilet when you're in your work environment, even if it's at a client's destination. And that particular individual had to go and pee in a field. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a cyclist. I'm OK with that. Um, but yeah. if. If I wasn't, then that's degrading, isn't it? And that's fearful. Uh, that would make me fearful to go to work at times. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was something that crossed my mind. And I've also spoken to a lot of people. I'm, I'm on something called the DAISY Network, which is for um, women with premature ovarian insufficiency. When I say women, there are girls with it as well. I'm meeting someone on Friday who was diagnosed at 15 years old. Um, and to, to give you some statistics, I'm I'm one in 100 um, that's diagnosed uh, below the age of, of 40 um, and 1.1 1 .1 diagnosed under the age of 30. And if I'd had the, had the correct diagnosis at 27, 26, then I would have been in that 0.1% of the population. But how do they get on at work? They have to start their career off with less energy than their peers, with erratic um, medication absorption issues, uh, emotional, um, psychological impact as well. Um, so everything that, that 
natural menopause gives plus a whole bucket load more and mm. they spend their whole career fe feeling inferior um and it's it's our own thought process that we have about ourselves is it actually the reality probably not um but they feel inferior they feel like they can't climb the the career ladder mm. um and therefore they become more introvert and step back um so how how would I like to see that managed in the workplace? But if you're in a male dominated environment, that is really tricky because actually I remember being told my menopause specialist was a man. And at the time I was so angry with everything. I was like, What's, what does a man know? <laughs> um, and actually he's the most amazing um, man. I'm so lucky to have him. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, perhaps in that environment, you 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 have this managed from an independent HR scenario and you have a package of surveys for people to fill in. Um, and if they're ticking the right boxes that they're struggling with vulvovaginal health or menopausal issues, perhaps um, there's a, a local WhatsApp group that they can become a part of, that they can meet at lunchtime. So you create a community. I'm thinking of Howby Park, where you've got lots of satellite work in small office scenarios. If you're just working with yourself all day, you only have your own thoughts to contend with as well. And creating like-minded communities, I think, are really, really important. Mm. And that can't always happen in the workplace, but perhaps the workplace can facilitate it. Mm. So, so almost like signposting. Yeah. People can go for support. So I guess as HR professionals or as managers, we need to have a role in kind of educating ourselves where people can go to support so we can be that signpost. But I think it's about almost like how do you bring up that topic? You know, it's a bit like when you can see someone's, suffering with mental health or even their physical health you know there's less of a barrier to now especially with the mental health thing to sitting down saying actually are you okay and there are some great tools out there actually for structuring conversations around mental health like from mind we use mind wellness mm -hmm. action plans but I'm just wondering actually those wellness action plans can apply in many different scenarios you know it doesn't just have to be about mental health there's no reason why we couldn't use as HR professionals and supporting our line managers to use wellness action plans even for these type of topics because it's a great I don't know if you've ever used them Claire but it is a great way of just structuring and a really open conversation about what do you need to be the best version of you at work and it for managers, those questions often don't come naturally. So feeling like they're using a structured resource from somebody as reputable as Mind is very reassuring. And you can kind of send the toolkit out to the employee first to say, have a look at this, have a think about it, fill out if you want to, fill out the answers to the questions, and then we can sit down and have a chat. And then, so again, you're, you're giving the employee um a safe space to bring up some of those topics without you having to go are you suffering from the menopause or do you know what I mean like having that awkward yeah. labeling conversation I, I I love that idea and I think for the employer in that scenario to have someone come in and one-to-one -one with them on what to expect and how to coach the individual I mean I would have absolutely have hated for my boss at the time to have sat down and spoken to me about it and mm. this doesn't happen so much I hope in natural menopause but particularly with premature ovarian insufficiency surgical menopause to mm. a degree where you've had ovarian cancer so um, uh, Eastern receptive uh, breast cancer is um, menopause where women are put into menopause because they're having such horrendous um, PMDD, which is intolerance to progesterone. Um, in your own progesterone, and you have just the most awful um, premenstrual tension, but it's called PMDD. Um, yeah, I mean, it's shame for us at the time. That the trauma and the shame attached to it is absolutely huge. Um, so to have that discussed from an external manager is a very difficult scenario. So to be able to go away, have the manager coached initially by, by someone like me um, and then go away, uh, the employee go away with a package of information to sit there and fill in. 
you've got to open the conversation up on on your side as well as the manager's side it's got to be uh the shame of it's got to be taken away the taboo's got to be taken away and I think that's happening I mean what's happened what I've seen happen in the last three years is incredible actually and there's some specific campaigners who've made that happen um and it's quite tremendous so I hope that filters through at all ends and all times I think it definitely is and, and there's definitely um, from a professional point of view there's I can see there's more companies are saying well you know sh- what should we be doing about this or should we have a policy or but it's very easy to kind of just say oh we've got a policy tick yeah. let's yeah. move on and then that's just having a policy obviously is never a solution for any HR matter for that matter you know but um it's it's about how you kind of normalize those conversations like we've just been saying one of we do have another poll actually that I just quickly want to do which is on what support do you think people would most benefit from in the workplace so I'm just going to quickly open that one up um so similar thing um just tick any that you think apply whilst we're doing the poll I thought I'd give some statistics um because it's really quite provocative over 50 just over 50 percent of our population are women um and 13 million of us are currently in menopause and one third of of that figure are are suffering significantly um within the workplace um and 10 years if if you're having a 10-year perimenopause phase that's a long time I think 10 hours a day you're at work you're spending a significant proportion of that time in the workplace and uh I looked at the statistics of people. I think it was something that Nick mentioned on LinkedIn, actually, that triggered me to look up the percentage of women in C-suite. And that was you, wasn't it, Nick, I think? Someone mentioned C-suite percentage of women. So 48% of women are in entry-level roles. 40% are managers. We keep going down now. 30% senior manager. 32% vice president, 28% senior VP, 26% are in C-suite. All that knowledge and experience and brilliance that you've learned across your career and able to apply is just not being brought forward. And I strongly suspect, I know it's because for many women, they're just not able to balance the pressure of that role along with um, life and and what they're going through. I'm just thinking back to one of the responses from the DAISY network. And I think she was a lawyer and uh, she said, actually her work was really, really understanding and they let her go part time. But even then it it wasn't enough for her to be able to um, continue with a role at that particular level. and maybe that's the right thing. It really is a time actually to nourish <laughs> nourish your brain and to come away from pressures. It's the most inflammatory time of your lives. And if you go into it with cortisol spikes all the time because um, your stress is unusually up and down and uh, you're just going to compound your symptoms and by keep on bashing away to maintain the person that you were doesn't mean that you can't come back into things in a different way once you've uh, um, rebooted if you like and one of my favorite phrases of this is that the topography has changed and you have to rewrite a map to fit in around where you are um, but that's pretty dire considering that you know there's already gender pay gap due in part to people taking time out for family leave isn't there and now if we're saying we've got to have menopause leave as well we're we're just we're stuffed, aren't we? <laughs> really? Yeah. Just only 20, 25% or whatever it was at senior levels. But just let's have a quick look at the poll. So it's quite interesting, given what you just said, actually, Claire, that the major one is how can we support overall health? So how do 
which is a bit what you were just saying there how do we just look after ourselves in this time um as well as you know how do we know when we do need help and where where do we go to get it I think generally um we're not very good at knowing when we need help particularly in the UK um and we only know what we know in our own brains and to have someone else uh who has different ways of thinking just guide us on that is uh, really valuable um so gaining advice uh straight away in fact we're going to show you a great booklet that you can get free of charge um that I give out to all my clients and it has been created by a lady called Diane Danzy Brink. Sorry, it's back to front. Um, oh, it's not, it's fine. She was in the music industry and she had such a horrendous menopause experience that she she's very open about this. She nearly killed herself. Um, yeah. And she's set up... I'm not sure I understand. Nor do many of us. Um, she's set up Menopause Matters and has been campaigning tire tirelessly uh, for the last few years to get legislations changed, um, menopause into schools, men menopause education, mm -hmm. um, and offer low costing menopause support privately because it's just not available on the NHS. So she has taken everything she has learned into this booklet from layman's terms. I think that's a nice place to start. And I think that's a great thing to have in the workplace. They are free of charge. Oh, really? um, she's trying to do everything she can. Um, she's sent me 50. And you can Maybe keep... you can send me the link, Claire, and I can circulate it to everyone here on this podcast, on this webinar, sorry. <laughs> um, so so in terms of supporting our general health, I mean, are there any other tips that you've got for us to kind of take away? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, clinical um, support is is key. Not everybody can take HRT, by the way. But um, so then what Jane is asking me becomes even more important at the moment. But making sure you're on, if you are able to take HRT, making sure that it's actually working for you. And if you're still feeling rubbish, then you need to go back and see your primary care GP and increase your dose. And that's the bit that's a grey area because not all GPs are trained. Um, and that's where I support people as well and GP specialists too. Um, but if you're just taking the clinical uh, approach and not addressing anything else in your general wellness and health, then there's only so far you're going to get. Um, you need to be looking at brain health, Heart health, this all sounds a little scary, but uh, brain health and, and heart health are really key. Um, particularly if you're not on HRT, you have estrogen receptors crying out for estrogen. Um, so if you're still, um, if you're not very active or you're not challenging your brain um, and checking in where your brain is, regularly, annually. Um, checking the, where it is. Where it's it's not there you, still. <laughs> you can do an annual test online. Um, oh, really? Yeah, there's a there's something that I share in my course um, that verbal reasoning, patterning, um, and, and just, you know, it's, it's going to alert you to where you are with your cognitive uh, abilities. And therefore, do you need to take up Sudoku? I don't know. It's something new, a new task. We talked about this yesterday, Jane, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, heart health is, is really key, particularly if you're early menopause or premature ovarian insufficiency because uh, of a buildup of plaque in the arteries. Um, so you need to be eating omega threes, omega six balances need to be good. You need to be looking at what you're eating from an inflammatory perspective. So that's sugar, um, alcohol. Oh, I've said the alcohol word. Um, and, and Mediterranean diets are great examples. Looking at fasting is is being shown to be really helpful for people who've got metabolic issues, pre diabetes. Um, so these all come into a much bigger, longer conversation. But mm. if you're noticing that you are piling on the pounds around your tummy, um, it is quite 
it's normal to a degree because your one type of your estrogen is now no longer um, producing. You've got a different type of estrogen in there and it sits on the belly around the uterus and provides a little bit of, of estrogen um, just in a, a slightly different version of it. it's estro instead of estradiol. And it's uh, it's the sort of fatty bit. But if you're getting larger all the time, this is fat growing on organs, et cetera, metabolic syndrome, which is linked to, to menopause when you're not taking care of your intake and you can't intake like you were in your 20s. So it's as simple as that. And exercising, presumably. Yeah, yeah so exercise. Yeah. But it's understanding the different types of exercise. So it's such a... It sounds like a one-stop shop. You've got cardiovascular, which is good for brain health and good for heart health um, and good for verbal reasoning again. Um, you've got strength training, so important. And lots of women totally miss out on strength training. Mm -hmm. I think I don't want to have big muscles. It's not about the aesthetics. It's about these are your suits of armor. So they have your amino acids in there. So if you're ill, inactive, then your organs feed off of your muscles. So they're absolutely essential for keeping you alive. Um, and they help to tug on the bones to help stimulate bone density. And when you go into menopause, your bone density drops by mm. up to about 30%. You are reliant on what you'd created in your 20s because you stop, you max out your bone density about 21. So if anyone has young girls, please make them do impact exercise. <laughs> Not yeah. horrendously impacting, but good, moderate impact exercise at a young age. It's so like what do you mean by that? Um, well, football, running, um, jumping, skipping, anything like that mm. is great. Uh, you do need to be a bit careful because bones are growing and you can uh, damage the end plates if you're doing really high impact stuff all the time. But it's having that good balance of skipping, jumping, running versus swimming and cycling, which don't do anything for bone density. Oh, really? Oh, that's um, annoying. And <laughs> sorry and computer gaming <laughs> but they do great things for your soul um so strength training for bones for sarcopenia uh your muscle loss decline is huge as you again because of an estrogen decline you have to work harder in your 40s to maintain what you had in your 30s even harder in your 50s even harder in your 60s and you have to keep applying that logic and it's actually quite a joyful thing to do I and mean, what's what's bad about doing a bit of exercise three times a week with strength training five times a week with cardiovascular and then we've got another category we've got four categories in exercise we've got stretch and balance so lots of studies show that regular stretching and flexibility is actually good for your um for arteries keeping our arteries lengthened um, and we've got balance with falls, et cetera, as well. So you could go yoga, tai chi, pilates, they all tick the, in fact, pilates ticks the strength training box to a degree. Oh, does it? Oh, good. It does. But you still need to do one session a week that you don't like, um, that, yeah, with weights and, and, and to push the boundaries. So. That's um, interesting, Claire. And then the final one, uh, sleep, I've already gone into detail about, and I run sleep camps with people to try and look at elements of why they're not sleeping. Um, and old trading rhythms is a real fascinating thing that I'll try and touch on quickly in a moment as well. Um, but nervous system work as well, brain exercise, mindfulness. Uh, if you are always switched on, your brain's not designed for that. This is we have circadian rhythms, but we also have old trading rhythms where brain waves have been shown that every 90 minutes they go through a cycle. So when you wake up in the morning, you're coming up on one and then after 90 minutes, you're having a bit of a dip. And if you keep ignoring that, um, then the level of burnout and fatigue, this is for anyone who, whether you're in menopause or not, will have uh, and chronic disease, inflammation, and if you're already in the most inflammatory part of your life with menopause and you're not sleeping properly, then it literally is a recipe for a car crash. Um, so if you sat down all day, getting up every 90 minutes and going into the kitchen, sticking the kettle on, doing something different with your brain, 
going to the loo without your phone. <laughs> if, if you're not sat down all day and you're moving, go and sit down for three minutes and just turn your brain off and look at nature or something. Um, I often do nature resets with, with clients who are really, really unwell. We just bring them back to thinking about the basic senses that um, they can f- detect when they're out on a short walk. Um, I was going to show a slide um, on resilience, but um, was this all atta- attaches into what we're talking about. If you're ignoring all these signs, symptoms are building up, signs uh, of fatigue, and you're going to definitely carry on as you are, and you're not going to let this get the better of you, um, then your ability, uh, your resilience ability eventually fades and everything will trigger and that emotional center in the brain will be overpowering the prefrontal cortex and this is where trauma uh, sets in trauma patterns that shall I share that slide James just, you can but I, I am just conscious of time and I did want to open the floor so hmm. you, could, you could alternatively we what do people want to do do they does anyone have any questions I was just wondering about opening the floor and we could always circulate the slide afterwards or what do you think? Should I do people Let's open the floor? Yeah, let me let me let me stop the um the recording.